Which of the following statements is true regarding the concept of an annuity contract? A. Payouts of an investment in a non-qualified annuity are all income tax-free B. The kind of annuity selected partly determines the payment amounts to the annuitant C. In the case of life annuity contracts, the age and sex of the annuitant do not affect the payment amounts D. The amounts of the periodic payments to the annuitant are determined by the performance of the insurance company's investment returns. Option B is correct. An annuity is a financial product that provides a series of payments made at equal intervals. There are various types of annuities, such as fixed, variable, and indexed annuities, and the type of annuity chosen influences the amount of the payments. The type of annuity chosen, fixed, variable, or indexed, affects the payment amounts. Fixed annuities provide regular, guaranteed payments, while variable and indexed annuities offer payments that can fluctuate based on the underlying investment performance. Option A is incorrect because payouts from a non-qualified annuity are not entirely income tax-free. The earnings portion of the payouts is subject to income tax, while the principal amount, the amount originally invested, is not taxed upon withdrawal. Option C is incorrect. In a life annuity, the age and sex of the annuitant often influence the payment amounts. Typically, annuities are priced based on life expectancy, therefore, younger annuitants or females, who generally have longer life expectancies, might receive smaller periodic payments than older annuitants or males. Option D is incorrect because while the performance of the insurance company's investments can influence the payments in a variable annuity, it is not the sole determinant of the payment amounts in all annuity contracts. For example, in a fixed annuity, payments are based on a predetermined rate and not directly on the performance of the company's investments. An investor owns 100 shares of XYZ common stock at the current market price of $50 per share. If XYZ conducts a 1 for 2 reverse stock split, the investor's post split stock position will be A. 50 shares at $25 per share B. 50 shares at $100 per share C. 200 shares at $25 per share D. 200 shares at $100 per share Option B is correct. In a reverse stock split, a company reduces the number of its outstanding shares and increases the price per share accordingly, without changing the overall market value of the shares held by investors. In a 1 for 2 reverse stock split, each shareholder receives one new share for every two shares they own. Given that the investor owns 100 shares of XYZ common stock at $50 per share before the split, after a 1 for 2 reverse stock split, the investor will have half the number of shares, which is 100 divides 2 equals 50 shares. The price per share will double to compensate for the reduced number of shares, making it $50 times 2 equals $100 per share. Thus, the investor's post-split position will be 50 shares at $100 per share. The redemption value of an open-end investment company's shares is based on the a. Previous offering price B. Previous closing NAVC. NAV computed after the order is received D. Offering price computed after the order is received. Option C is correct. An open-end investment company, commonly known as a mutual fund, allows investors to buy and sell shares directly from the fund. The redemption value of the shares, which is the price at which investors can sell their shares back to the fund, is based on the net asset value computed after the order to redeem the shares is received. The NAV used to determine the redemption value is computed after the fund receives the order. This ensures that the redemption price reflects the current value of the fund's underlying assets at the time of the redemption. Option A is incorrect because the redemption value is not based on the previous offering price. The offering price is relevant for purchasing new shares, not for redeeming them. Option B is incorrect because the redemption value is not based on the previous closing NAV. It is based on the NAV calculated after the redemption order is received. Option D is incorrect because the redemption value is based on the NAV, not the offering price. The offering price may include a sales charge, load, and is relevant for buying shares, while the redemption value is based on the NAV for selling shares. When is interest on treasury notes paid? A. Quarterly B. Semi-annually C. Annually D. At maturity. Option B is correct. Treasury notes, which are intermediate term debt securities issued by the U.S. government, pay interest every six months, or semi-annually. These interest payments are made until the note reaches its maturity, at which point the principal amount is also repaid. 
The interest on treasury notes is paid semi-annually, typically every six months from the issue date until maturity. Company ABC announces a 20% stock dividend for its common shareholders. If a customer holds 1,000 shares at $50, what is the new price and number of shares following the payment of the stock dividend? A. 800 shares at $62.50 B. 1,000 shares at $41.67 C. 1,200 shares at $41.67 D. 1,200 shares at $50 Option C is correct. A stock dividend involves issuing additional shares to existing shareholders in proportion to their current holdings. A 20% stock dividend means that for every 100 shares owned, an investor receives an additional 20 shares, given that the customer holds 1,000 shares. With a 20% stock dividend, the customer will receive 20% of 1,000 shares, which is 200 additional shares. Therefore, the new total number of shares is 1,200 shares. The total market value of the shares before the dividend is $50 per share times 1,000 shares equals $50,000. After the dividend, the total market value remains the same, but it is now distributed over more shares. To find the new price per share, divide the total market value by the new number of shares. $50,000 divides 1,200 shares equals approximately $41.67 per share. Thus, the new price and number of shares following the payment of the stock dividend are 1,200 shares at $41.67 each. Under FINRA rules, non-cash compensation connected with the sale of variable contracts includes all of the following items except A. Gifts B. Meal C. Lodging D. Commissions Option D. Commissions is the correct answer because commissions are considered a form of cash compensation. Commissions are typically paid as a percentage of the sales made by the broker or sales representative and are a direct monetary payment. Under FINRA rules, non-cash compensation refers to compensation received by brokers or sales representatives that is not in the form of cash. This can include various perks or benefits provided by a company in connection with the sale of products such as variable contracts, which include variable annuities and variable life insurance. Typical forms of non-cash compensation include gifts, meals, and lodging, but do not include commissions. Option A, gifts, option B, meals, and option C, lodging, are all forms of non-cash compensation. They may be provided as incentives or rewards in connection with the sale of financial products. Non-cash compensation is subject to specific rules and limits to ensure that it does not improperly influence the sale of securities and investment products. Commissions, being a direct form of monetary compensation, fall under different regulations and guidelines. A firm is a participant in a public offering. To sell a substantial amount of the securities to its customers, the firm agrees to repurchase the shares at no less than the original sales price. Such agreements are A. Prohibited as fraudulent and manipulative B. Permissible if the securities are deposited into escrow C. Prohibited unless the firm immediately sets aside funds for the repurchase D. Permissible if the customers retain the right to sell the securities into the open market Option A is correct because these types of agreements are considered fraudulent and manipulative. They distort the market's perception of the security's value and demand, which is contrary to the principles of fair and transparent markets. In the context of a public offering, a firm agreeing to repurchase shares from its customers at no less than the original sales price is considered a manipulative and deceptive practice. Such agreements are prohibited because they create an artificial price support for the securities, misleading the market about their true demand and value. Option B is incorrect. Whether the securities are deposited into escrow is irrelevant to the prohibitive nature of such agreements. The key issue is the promise of a guaranteed price, which manipulates market dynamics. Option C is incorrect. Setting aside funds for the repurchase does not legitimize the agreement. The fundamental issue is the agreement's effect on market integrity, not the firm's ability to finance the repurchase. Option D is incorrect. The customer's right to sell the securities on the open market is not a factor that would make such agreements permissible. The prohibition is based on the manipulative nature of guaranteeing a specific repurchase price, regardless of the market conditions or customers' rights. A member of a stock exchange responsible for providing liquidity in a security by being willing to buy and sell it at all times is known as A. Broker B. Underwriter 
C. Market Maker D. Transfer Agent Option C, Market Maker, is correct. A market maker is a member of a stock exchange who is responsible for providing liquidity to the market. They do this by being willing to buy and sell specific securities at publicly quoted prices, ensuring that there is always a market for those securities. Option A, Broker, is incorrect. A broker acts as an intermediary between buyers and sellers in securities transactions, but does not typically provide liquidity by continuously buying and selling securities. Option B, underwriter, is incorrect. An underwriter is involved in the process of issuing new securities, such as during an initial public offering (IPO), by assuming the risk of buying the securities from the issuer and selling them to investors. Underwriters do not provide continuous liquidity in the secondary market. Option D, transfer agent, is incorrect. A transfer agent is responsible for maintaining records of investors and account balances and securities, handling the transfer of securities titles, and other related administrative functions. They do not engage in buying and selling securities to provide liquidity. Which of the following outcomes are possible for the writer of a covered call option? A. Profit limited and loss limited B. Profit limited and loss unlimited C. Profit unlimited and loss limited D. Profit unlimited and loss unlimited. Option A is correct. The profit for the writer of a covered call is limited because the maximum profit is achieved if the stock price remains below the strike price of the call option. In this case, the writer keeps the premium received from selling the call option. However, any gain in the stock's value above the strike price is offset by the obligation to sell the stock if the option is exercised. The loss is limited because the writer owns the underlying stock. The worst case scenario is that the stock's value drops to zero, minus the premium received for selling the option. In a cover call option strategy, the investor, or writer, owns the underlying stock and writes, sells, a call option on that stock. This strategy has both a limited profit potential and a limited loss potential. Option B is incorrect because the loss is not unlimited in a covered call strategy. The presence of the underlying stock owned by the writer limits the loss. Option C is incorrect because the profit potential is not unlimited. It's capped at the premium received for selling the call, plus any appreciation of the stock up to the strike price. Option D is incorrect because neither the profit nor the loss is unlimited in a covered call strategy. Both are limited by the factors mentioned above. Which of the following investment risks is the greatest risk in a variable life insurance policy? A. Credit risk B. Market risk C. Inflation risk D. Interest rate risk. Option B. Market risk is correct. Market risk, also known as investment risk or systematic risk, is the primary risk in a variable life insurance policy. This is because the policy's value is directly tied to the performance of the investments chosen, which can fluctuate due to market movements. A variable life insurance policy is a type of life insurance that includes an investment component. The cash value and death benefit of the policy can vary based on the performance of the investment options chosen by the policyholder, which are typically invested in a range of securities like stocks and bonds. Option A, credit risk, is not the greatest risk in a variable life insurance policy. Credit risk, or the risk that an issuer of a bond will default on payments, is more relevant to fixed income investments. Option C, inflation risk, is not the greatest risk, although it is a concern. Inflation risk is the risk that the purchasing power of the policy's benefits or cash value will be eroded by inflation. Option D, interest rate risk, is more pertinent to fixed income investments. While it can impact the variable life insurance policy's bond investments, it is not considered the greatest risk compared to market risk. Under Rule 144A, an issuer of restricted stock is permitted to sell to which of the following investors? A. Financial institutions B. Accredited investors C. Qualified institutional buyers QIB D. Non-accredited investors who have previously purchased restricted stock Option C is correct. Rule 144A allows for the sale of restricted securities to QIB, which are institutional investors that own and invest a minimum of $100 million in securities on a discretionary basis. Rule 144A is a regulation under the U.S. Securities Act of 1933 that provides a safe harbor exemption from the registration requirements for certain private resales of restricted securities to qualified institutional buyers. 
This rule is designed to facilitate the trading of unregistered securities among institutional investors. Option A is not specific enough. While many financial institutions may qualify as QIB, not all financial institutions automatically qualify under Rule 144A. Option B is incorrect. Accredited investors, as defined by the SEC, include individuals and entities that meet certain income or net worth criteria. However, the Rule 144A exemption specifically applies to sales to QIB, not just any accredited investors. Option D is incorrect. The previous purchase of restricted stock does not qualify a non-accredited investor to purchase securities under Rule 144A. The rule specifically targets QIB, regardless of their previous transactions in restricted stock. The computation of dollar prices and accrued interest on municipal bonds is normally on what calendar basis? A. 3360B, 3365C, Actual 360D, Actual 365. Option A is correct. This is the conventional method used for calculating accrued interest on municipal bonds, as it simplifies the calculation by standardizing the number of days in each month and the total number of days in a year. When computing dollar prices and accrued interest on municipal bonds, the industry standard is typically to use a 30, 360 calendar basis. This method assumes that each month has 30 days and that there are 360 days in a year. This simplification facilitates the calculation of accrued interest and bond prices. A transaction in which a writer covers a position by purchasing an option is called A. A closing sale B. A closing purchase C. An opening sale D. An opening purchase. Option B is correct. This is the term used when a writer of an option buys back the same option to close an open short position. In options trading, a closing purchase is a transaction where the writer, seller, of an option buys back the same option to close out or cover their open position. This transaction effectively nullifies the writer's obligation to fulfill the terms of the option contract. Option A is incorrect. A closing sale would involve an option holder selling an option they previously bought, thus closing out their long position. Option C is incorrect. An opening sale is when an investor initiates a short position by selling an option they do not currently hold. Option D is incorrect. An opening purchase is when an investor initiates a long position by buying an option. A customer is an officer of a company that is involved in some significant changes. All of the following items are examples of corporate affairs that could be considered inside information if the customer shares them with his registered representative except A. Pending transactions B. Declared stock dividend C. Top management changes D. Imminent financial liquidity problems Option B is the correct answer. Once a stock dividend is declared, it becomes public information. Therefore, sharing this information would not be considered inside information, as it is already disclosed to the public. Inside information refers to material, non-public information about a company that could influence an investor's decision to buy or sell securities. If a company officer shares such information, it could be considered illegal insider trading if used for trading purposes. However, not all information shared by company officers constitutes inside information. Option A could be considered inside information if it is material and not publicly disclosed. For example, information about a merger, acquisition, or significant contract that has not been announced to the public would be inside information. Option C could be considered inside information if the changes are material and have not yet been publicly announced. Changes in top management can significantly affect a company's direction and performance. Option D could be considered inside information if it is material and not yet public. Information about significant financial difficulties could greatly impact the company's stock price. Stability in the value of a debt portfolio is greatest when A. Interest rates are rising B. Interest rates are falling C. Maturities of the debt securities are long D. Maturities of the debt securities are short Option D is correct. Short-term debt securities are less sensitive to interest rate changes compared to long-term securities. Therefore, a debt portfolio composed of short maturity securities will exhibit greater stability in value, regardless of the direction of interest rate movements. The stability in the value of a debt portfolio is influenced by the interest rate environment and the duration of the debt securities in the portfolio. 
duration is a measure of the sensitivity of the price of a bond, or a bond portfolio, to changes in interest rates. Generally, the longer the maturity of the debt securities, the greater their price volatility in response to interest rate changes. Option A is incorrect because when interest rates rise, the value of existing bonds typically falls, especially those with longer maturities. This is due to the inverse relationship between bond prices and interest rates. Option B is also incorrect because, although falling interest rates generally lead to an increase in the value of existing bonds, this does not necessarily imply stability. Bonds with longer maturities would still experience significant price volatility in response to interest rate changes. Option C is incorrect. Long-term debt securities are more sensitive to interest rate changes, which can lead to greater volatility in their value. 